weeks, a month and a half, we've been talking about Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, speaking of Jesus in His ministry after the flesh. In 2 Corinthians 5.16, which has been the theme verse of the series, Paul says, We know no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. And so we've drawn this same chart every lesson where Christ after the flesh is Paul referring to Christ's ministry according to prophecy to Israel and His death and resurrection for Israel and even last week covered His return to Israel in the future. And so this is Jesus after the flesh. And then He says, Yet now henceforth know we Him no more. And so Paul, as Christ appeared to him, Paul says, Now we know Jesus in a way that was not known before. And so I think it's important for us, members of the body of Christ, uh, followers of the Apostle Paul, sent by Christ, that we understand what it means to know Jesus now. How is that different? Most people have the idea that what we know about Jesus ends in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is the red letter books of your Bible. That's what they call them uh, because they think that's the only thing Jesus ever said. That would be incorrect. Okay, but this is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what we know about Jesus. The rest is just the church doing its thing. Well, that's not what the Bible says. And so we'll be studying it today that Jesus, when he died, he did rise, and then he sent some 12 apostles to do something. He said he would return in the future to fulfill that which he left undone here. And he also returned to the Apostle Paul. And he gave him some information. And so the, the focus of our, our lesson today will be on Jesus revealing the mystery uh, today and what he's doing now. How we now know Jesus and how that's different than how Jesus after the flesh has been taught the last six weeks and how we can know Jesus after the flesh. As we do a review of the last six weeks, you know the focus, when you focus on Jesus after the flesh, what you hear are the subjects we've been talking about. Jesus born in the manger, for example, is literally Him coming incarnate in the flesh. And so that's Jesus after the flesh. Talking about the parables of Jesus, the parables He spoke in His earthly ministry to Israel. Uh, speaking about the prophecies and how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies and will fulfill the prophecies. This is all Jesus and His ministry on earth as it will be fulfilled for the earth in his earthly people is Jesus after the flesh. Okay, when you talk about Jesus' humanity, which is still true today, of course, he, he has human nature and a deity, but when you emphasize and speak about his humanity, usually you go back to when he was walking around on earth in his humanity. And so the conversations about that normally go back to Jesus after the flesh in his earthly ministry. Uh, speaking about the New Testament, which we dealt with in a lesson about the death of the testator. Speak of the New Testament, which replaces the old, given to the same people, which are God's earthly people, the nation of Israel. And so the New Testament must, of necessity, go back and focus on Jesus after the flesh, and He was a sacrifice for that New Testament, and that New Testament is God establishing the house of Israel and the kingdom on the earth. Uh, spiritual Israel, that kind of conversation, is the subject of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when Jesus came to Israel, and yet he came to divide them between those that would not believe him and those that would. And thus there was spiritual Israel, those that would believe him and those that were not receiving him. Okay? Speaking of Jesus as a sacrifice, which again was true, he was a sacrifice for sins. Hebrews teaches that, Jesus taught that, the Old Testament pictured that and taught that. But speaking of Jesus' death merely as a sacrifice is speaking of him after the flesh, because the sacrifice is his flesh. Hebrews explains that. And so, the sacrifice of His flesh is how the Scriptures speak of it. When speaking of signs, like the signs of His return, we dealt with this last week. You know, Jesus taught in His earthly ministry a lot about His future return and signs of it. But that conversation is a focus of Jesus after the flesh. Yeah. End time events. We talk about, well, is this an end time event? Is it an end time sign? Are the ends ha is the end happening now? This is, again, a focus of the flesh. Because when people talk about His return, they're usually talking about His return here to earth, which fulfills the purpose he stated after the flesh for Israel. Okay, so in time events. You see a, a description of all of these things in Acts chapter 1. Look at Acts 1. I purposely start off here because the book of the Acts of the Apostles deals with Jesus' ministry after his death and resurrection and ascension through the Apostles. And what's interesting about this, we learn what the Apostles' ministry were who followed him in his earthly ministry. And then we'll learn today about an apostle found in the book of the Acts that was not around in his earthly ministry and whether he's doing the same thing or not. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. This is the Gospel of Luke, part 2, is what this is. 
the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So Luke wrote this book as a sequel to his Gospel of Luke. He says, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he hath chosen. Notice, he's, he wrote his previous book, Luke, about everything that happened until his death and resurrection, until the day he was taken up. And Acts 1 begins with Jesus' ascension into heavenly places in Acts 1. First thing that happens. But notice what he says, until that day he was taken up, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So what you have is Jesus after the flesh dying, raising from the dead, those gospels are over, Acts record begins, and he ascends to heaven, and he's giving commandments here after his resurrection to his apostles. And thus, Acts is, he, this is a description of that. What did Jesus command his apostles to do after his death and resurrection? Right? So with, again, the mindset that what we know about Jesus is everything from the cross be, you know, in the past, from this period here, is wrong even in Acts 1. Because Acts is the record of what Jesus commanded after his death and resurrection. You see? Of course, some of those commands you'll find at the very end of Acts, Matthew, and John, the so-called Great Commission, and Mark 16, the signs that follow those that believe, and Luke 24, the staying in Jerusalem to preach remission of sins. But Acts is, is the practice of this. So it says, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Did he, at this point, had chosen Paul? No. Paul was not yet an apostle. He had chosen 12. One of them uh, was a devil. One of them betrayed him, and he gets replaced in Acts chapter 1. Verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We have absolutely no record of what Jesus taught in those forty days, except for these final words before his ascension. Okay, we do have some in Luke 24 and John 21 and 22, and what he says is simply an explanation of what he had taught them in his earthly ministry, what the law and the prophets and the Psalms said should happen. Remember, we covered Jesus' life being prophesied, and everything that was prophesied. When he raised from the dead, he came to his apostles and said, See, I told you, everything's prophesied. And for 40 days he explained this, connecting prophecy to the things that he had done, even his death and resurrection. So for 40 days he spoke to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. What's the promise of the Father? Wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Ghost, for the Holy Spirit. That's the promise of the Father. Jesus taught about that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The promise of the Father that he had promised, by the way, in the Old Testament, that he would send his Spirit. Jesus came and said, I need to go away so I can send you the Holy Ghost, I send you the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. In Acts 1, he says, stay and wait in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, which you have heard of me. Okay, the Holy Spirit is not a secret thing. It's not something that was not known before. Just like the prophets spoke about and Jesus spoke about before. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Notice this is the second time in six verses that the subject of the apostles here, the twelve apostles, is the kingdom. We restore the kingdom of Israel. He taught them forty days after his resurrection about the kingdom. Then he ascended to heaven. They asked him before he left, will you at this time restore the kingdom? Their focus is on the earthly kingdom, yeah. the things that the parables were talking about, the earthly kingdom, right? When he was going to come back, like in the flesh, he had come, he's about to leave, they're saying, when are you going to come back? Right? They're focusing on Jesus after the flesh. The signs of his return. In Matthew 24, the apostles asked, when will be the signs of your return? Now, he's not going to preach a whole discourse here in Acts 1, but it's essentially the same thing. Will you at this time? Is now the time? You know, and Jesus responds in verse 7, it is not for you to know the times of the season, which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive the power, receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria. There's no Gentiles there. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. There's no Gentiles until the uttermost parts of the earth. Which means their ministry has to expand beyond the city, beyond Judea, beyond all of Israel, then the nations. Okay, they can't skip. I think we'll start with the other parts of the world. Jesus said, start in Jerusalem. By the way, looking ahead in Acts, they never got past Jerusalem. Okay, and so there, there's a halt to that. But 
You see in Acts 1 through 8 here, these issues. And in verse 9, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. That's the ascension. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up at heaven? Into heaven, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go to heaven. So Jesus went to heaven. They saw him. And the angel said, he'll come back to the same mountain we saw last week. He'll come to the same mountain that he left from, Mount of Olives. Okay? And that's what the prophet said would happen. And so that's Acts chapter 1. But this is Jesus after the flesh. I bring this up because we're talking about the apostolic ministry now, right? And the 12 apostles are still communicating and knowing Jesus after the flesh. So when is this now what we know about Jesus occur? It didn't change here. It didn't change after his death and resurrection because he taught them about the kingdom. He taught them about restoring the prophetic kingdom. He talked about him coming back in person in the flesh. He didn't say, I'm going to start a whole new ministry now. Now that I'm going away, there's a new way for you to minister. He didn't describe that. He says, do what we've been doing. Since John the Baptist, water baptized, preached the kingdom is at hand. And we'll, we'll proceed. Look at Acts chapter 2. We'll get here in a little bit. When Paul says, henceforth know we him no more, after the flesh, that's what he's saying. It's saying that now, in this dispensation of grace, now in the church, the body of Christ, now that we have the revelation of Christ given to the Apostle Paul, we can now know Jesus in a way that is not after the flesh. Okay. We have known him, that's what Paul says, yea, though we have known him after the flesh. So it's not that we should be ignorant of what we've been learning the last six weeks, which is why we did it. We need to know why Jesus came, what the purpose was, not without any distortion or input from things that we now know. Because it wasn't revealed then. So we need to have known him here. And with the Bible, we can have known him. But henceforth, yet henceforth, now know we him no more. There's a more excellent way to know Jesus. And that's the point. It's not simply they're different. They are. But there's something more excellent. There's something better. There's a better, more glorious way today to know Jesus than knowing Jesus after the flesh. If all you know is Jesus after the flesh, then you're waiting for him to come back. You're looking for signs that, that don't occur. You're trying to understand parables, which you can't understand. You're trying to make yourself Israel, which you're not. Yeah. Right? You're trying to remember his life after the flesh. Trying to mimic maybe his life after the flesh, which you can't do. And which is why the church struggles quite often. They're neglecting, ignoring, or simply de-emphasizing knowing Jesus this more excellent way. So the question today is, how do we know him now? What does that mean? What is he doing now? What do, we, what do we know about him now? How is that different than before? So, of course, as you might expect, the, the contrast to knowing much of the flesh and what has been prophesied is this mystery revealed. Right? And the topic, uh, the subject of the, today's lesson is Jesus reveals the mystery. The mystery of Christ is not something that Paul revealed. It's something Jesus, maybe I'll use a different color here. It's something that Jesus revealed to the Apostle Paul. Okay, and this has big implications. As we've been studying through Matthew, Luke, and John, and Acts chapter 1, all the conversation was about Jesus' return here, in prophecy according to the kingdom after the flesh on the earth. In Acts chapter 2, look at verse 14. After the Holy Ghost was sent from heaven, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues, known tongues of people from different nations in that space. You know that because the people who were hearing them speak in tongues said, hey, he's speaking my language. That's my paraphrase. But you read the, the verses in between here, that's what they're saying. They're not saying, wow, a divine unknown language. They're saying they're speaking in our, our languages. Yeah. They're known languages. Acts 2, verse 14, Peter, standing up the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Jesus came as a minister of the circumcision. He was a minister of the circumcision. We covered that in lesson one. Remember that? He came to Israel. Who's Peter preaching to in Acts chapter 2? Israel. Audience hasn't changed. You see? Doing the same thing. Be it known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day, speaking in different languages. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Amen. This, in Acts 2 at Pentecost, is what Joel prophesied in Joel chapter 2 and 3. So remember we talked about Jesus fulfilling prophecy in his birth, in his life, in his message, in his death, and resurrection. What's Peter saying? Prophecy is being fulfilled today, too, in the Holy Ghost being sent down. Right? So again, it's the same, the same message as far as prophetic fulfillment that we saw in Jesus' earthly ministry. Peter's continuing that. In Acts chapter uh, 2, verse, uh, 
Look down at verse 36. He preaches his message talking about how Jesus fulfilled prophecy. He's the one. He did the miracles. He performed the ministry. He fulfilled prophecy. He's Christ. Acts 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Why not Gentiles? Because Jesus came to Israel. He was a minister of the circumcision. And that has not changed yet. It will, but it hasn't yet. Right? Which means Acts 2 is not the birthday of the church. Amen. As if Jesus just forgot after 40 days of teaching to tell them, whoops, I meant the church should be for all people. No, for 40 days he taught them, and the first thing out of Peter's mouth, by the Holy Ghost, by the way, is house of Israel, men of Judah. Right? Why didn't he say, into all that here? No, he didn't say that. You think that would, would be something Pauline sounding for the church today. But Acts 2, verse 37. Verse 36 says, Let the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's the message. Jesus is Christ. Proof, he rose from the dead. Right, that's the sign of who he was. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, Well, I'm not done yet. I'm I want to tell you also about how Christ died for your sins. He rose from the dead. No, he didn't say that. He was done with the message. He's both Lord and Christ. What shall you do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. By the way, that repent and baptize was not new. That was the same thing John the Baptist did. This is the same thing Jesus did. Same thing Peter does here. The name of Jesus Christ, Jesus said that too. He said, be water baptized in my name. The new thing here is, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because that's now what Christ sent from heaven. And that's what Peter explains. Christ is in heaven, and he sent the Holy Ghost, which you now see in here. So repent and be baptized, same message. In the name of Jesus Christ, same message, and receive the Holy Ghost. Oh, there's something different. But it's the Holy Ghost that was promised and prophesied before. And so, but the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. But it's to Israel and their children, no matter where they're at, and then the innermost parts of the world. That's Acts chapter 1. Look at Acts 3, verse 18. <clears throat> Peter's second recorded sermon here. Acts 3.18. Those things which God hath before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Our study has shown that Jesus' earthly ministry fulfilled prophecy. That's why he came to do. That's what Peter preached after he left. Acts 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Again, the repent and conversion is not necessarily a new message for Israel. But now it's the name of Jesus. That your sins may be blotted out. Oh, for mission of sins here. That's, a, that's a, a good thing, through the name of Jesus. When? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Is the Lord present in Acts 3? No. This is when he becomes present. Amen. When he comes back after the flesh, your sins get forgiven. So when the judge comes back and judges for your sins, your sins are forgiven when he comes back. That's what Peter's preaching. Because you could have had him forgiven here. right? And if you believe, maybe they'll... But lay their hands on you and forgive your sins then. But when he comes back is when Jesus brings forgiveness. Acts 3, verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. <clears throat> so Peter's preaching, repent so that God will send Jesus back. Isn't that what he says? Repent so your sins are blotted out and God will send Jesus back. That's the message. Now any church preaching that message today has totally missed knowing Jesus now. Okay, and look what he's doing now. If the message is, you better repent or you'll get judged, and if you repent, he'll send Jesus soon. Like that is Peter's message at Pentecost here, in Acts 3. And that's Jesus after the flesh. God is not waiting for more people to get saved today to send Jesus back. He's not doing that today. He wants all men to be saved. But there's no connection to his return and how he will get saved. But there was for Peter. Verse 21 whom the heaven must receive until when? The time's restitution of all things, when he restores all things on the earth, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Is there anything that was secret that Peter is revealing here? No. Did, he's filled with the Holy Ghost, remember. Did the Holy Ghost reveal anything to Peter that Jesus forgot to say, didn't say? Because Jesus said the Holy Ghost will bring you to knowledge. Not in Acts 3. No, the Holy Ghost is telling Peter what to say. He's a fisherman, by the way. He's not this articulate. But he's quoting prophecy at the right times. He's knowing what to say. He knows exactly what to say about Jesus after the flesh and according to prophecy. Okay? Look at Acts 9. So we're progressing through Acts, and this ministry goes on for a few more chapters. In Acts chapter 9, 
<coughs> you have the introduction of this new character. He actually showed up in Acts 7 at the stoning of Stephen. Saul was the enemy of these apostles, of Stephen, who was one of the disciples there filled with the Holy Ghost, and helped stone him. In Acts 9, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Jesus is speaking to his arch enemy on earth. Like the, in, the chief opposition to these guys who are throwing them in prison, Saul, Jesus is now speaking to, saying, Why are you resisting me? Arise and go into the city, it shall be told thee what thou must do. <clears throat> Look at Acts 26. In Acts 26, in verse 16. <clears throat> this is Paul, later in his life and ministry, explaining before a tribunal, a court, how he was converted. Because that, in Paul's life, was the big deal, because at one point he was slaughtering these people, and now he's one of them, it seems like. So how did that happen? So he's telling what happened. <clears throat> and it was not because he was persuaded by Peter. He wasn't persuaded <clears throat> by the Holy Ghost filled apostles about the prophetic ministry of Jesus. It's that Jesus himself appeared to him. Acts 26, 16. You see in verse 15 where we left off in Acts 9. Jesus appears to him, says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Notice Jesus continues talking in verse 16. You don't find this in Acts 9. Right? But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and to witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of the things, those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open there the Gentiles' eyes, and, of, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto, unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> That's quite the commission that Christ gave Paul the day he appeared to him. Now, people read Acts 9, they say, what did Jesus tell Paul? Well, you can read some input in Acts 26 of what Jesus told Paul on that day. Okay. But that's a second issue. The point here is that Jesus is appearing to Paul and saying, I'm going to send you as a minister. In 2 Timothy 1, in verse 11, Paul says, he appointed me a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. In Acts 26, he says, that, that was from the day that he saved me. He appointed me to that. Chief enemy, Jesus appears to him, saving him by not what he did, which means it's by grace. He didn't deserve it. He was opposing Jesus. It was by his grace. And makes him an apostle and a preacher and a teacher. Wow. It seems like there should be some time there before Paul gets caught up on things. Jesus had a purpose that he was implementing. This purpose was something that was not known before. He had told the 12 apostles, wait for me to return from heaven to come with the kingdom. He appears from heaven to Paul, the enemy, and says, I'm making you an apostle. What happened? Did his 12 fail? And then, I'm trying again with you. Well, they didn't fail, but Israel did. And Jesus is doing something new with Paul. But you only know that if you read Acts. So when you talk about Jesus and his ministry, you can't just say it's here in Matthew, Luke, and John. He spoke to these guys for 40 days, and then he came back to Paul. Jesus is speaking things here. In fact, if you have a red letter Bible, these words in Acts 26 are red letters. That's Jesus speaking just as much as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as far as authority. So the question here is, what is this apostleship he's sending Paul to preach? Is Paul going to preach prophecy and the kingdom come and Jesus fulfilling all those things that the prophets spoke since the world began? Is that it? Well, then you start reading Paul's epistles and you find that that's not it. Look at Galatians chapter 1. We have 13 epistles. Paul wrote more. Uh, than any other author of the New Testament save John. But in Acts chapter, or excuse me, Galatians 1. We're going to Galatians 1 verse 12. Galatians 1, the whole chapter, Paul's defending the fact that he's not preaching his message because a man taught it to him. But Jesus taught it to him. Verse 1, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. He's not an apostle by men. It's by Jesus Christ. Verse 12, 
I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. His disciples were preaching a kingdom, waiting for that kingdom to come, preaching the kingdom that would come if they repented at Pentecost. And here's Paul saying, the gospel I'm preaching, Jesus gave to me. Well, Paul, you were an enemy here, and I mean, you were definitely not a believer here. Jesus gave you a gospel? What is that? I mean, the question is valid. What is the gospel he gave you? And when Paul says a dispensation of the gospel is given to me, it's the gospel of the grace of God, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, then it really should cause you to pause and be like, well, wait a minute. Nothing here was revealed as a mystery. Why is Paul saying my gospel was according to the revelation of the mystery that was given to me? Jesus had a mystery, or a ministry, that was a mystery, that was kept secret. Amen. And what God is doing now, through Jesus Christ, and through the, the church, of which He is the head, is a ministry that was kept secret and was a, minister, a mystery, first given to the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians 3, you see it here as well. Now these are very foundational verses to show someone that there's a mystery preaching of Jesus Christ. There's a way we know Him now. Now, these verses don't go into the details of what that is. We'll cover that here in a moment. But you first got to realize that Jesus had a ministry that he revealed to the Apostle Paul specifically. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. You see, it's, it's very clear language there. Christ gave Paul a dispensation of grace. What is it? You need to read around to find, figure that out. Verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me. You mean you didn't walk with him on earth? Nope. You mean for 40 days you weren't in that conference, the kingdom conference? Nope. By revelation. The revelation he had on the day he was saved and the further revelations that Jesus said I would appear unto you and tell you about. Okay. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge that he got from Christ in the mystery of Christ. You see, the language we use about the mystery of Christ and the mystery, and this is biblical language, folks. It's not something we're creating a form of system of theology or something. This is a language that, that the Scripture uses about Jesus revealing something to Paul. And, and this is why it's, it's very hard to dispute this. Okay, it really very is. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Ages is time as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is where the objections come. Well, you see right there, it says apostles, plural, and prophets, plural, and it says it wasn't known as it is now revealed. So they could have known something back here, but it wasn't known as much as now. Well, if it wasn't known as much as now, it's known now different than before, yes? And it says plural apostles. That means it's the 12 apostles. Well, it may or may not be. Nevertheless, what did they know? We can read from the Scriptures what they knew. In Luke 18, they didn't even know why Jesus needed to die. In Mark 9, they were scared to ask him about it. Okay, in Matthew, they sorrowed when Jesus told them he would die and the third day rise again. They sorrowed. Oh, that's terrible. Right? Christians react this way to the cross sometimes. When Paul preaches the cross, it's your salvation and glory. Okay? So, they, the twelve apostles did not know something that Paul did. Peter himself writes this in 2 Peter 3 when he says, what Paul writes to you, some things are hard to be understood. Right. There's a reason why all this is in Scripture. You can't just throw it out and say, oh, there was a little confusion at the beginning, but now it's all ironed out. Apparently, this is significant. And this all happened after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus' earthly ministry. That this apostle was chosen, specially, because he was not chosen because he was following Jesus. He was chosen because he was opposing Jesus, apparently. And he was given an apostleship from day one. And this message concerns a gospel, Galatians 1.12, the gospel I preached was given to me of Jesus Christ. It includes an identity. It's going to include who you are, as Paul will go on to talk about this mystery being a body, and talk about your inheritance. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 6. This is the mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. There's a mystery concerning an inheritance that was not known before. What was their inheritance here? An earthly kingdom. All the prophets spoke of that. What's your inheritance? Not that. You see, this concerns an inheritance. And it concerns, in verse 6, that they should be the Gentiles of the same body. 
And there was no manuscript, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, or, well, I can't say English because they added the word in English Bibles that says the same body with Israel. It's not, they add that in. Talk about textual criticism. It's like it's not even there. Why did they put with Israel? Because that is a doctrinal interpretation that does not exist in the verse. This body is not the same body with Israel. It's the same body of Christ, which Paul says in Romans 12 and Ephesians chapter 1. Right? But their inheritance, you're, the body of Christ is who you are. That is separate. There is no talk of the body of Christ in Jesus' earthly ministry or in the prophets since the world began. The body of Christ is unique language to this dispensation. But now there's a body. There's a gospel that Christ revealed to me. There's heirs. In fact, joint heirs. Because you're heirs with Christ as sons of God. And so you have Paul speaking about these revelations that concern a gospel, an identity, and an inheritance among the Gentiles. Okay. Ephesians 3, verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the, the, the gift of the grace of God given unto me. The mystery, concerned, we covered fellow heirs, we covered body, we didn't read the last part. Partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The gospel Paul preaches allows and makes Gentiles partakers of his promise. Verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me, by the effectual working of his power. I think it's a half a dozen times now Paul has emphasized me, me and I, given to me in this passage. Unto me, again, verse 8, who in the less than the least of all saints is this grace given? That's how it's grace, because he was not the greatest saint. He was the least of all saints. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's not preaching among the Gentiles that which was spoken by the prophets about the Gentiles since we'll begin. You can search those out and find out what the Gentiles get. And by the way, what the Gentiles get according to this message after the flesh is not as great as what Israel got. They, the Gentiles bring their riches to Israel, but the Gentiles get blessed as a result. Right? But here, there's unsearchable riches. Amen. There's all spiritual blessings. Paul prays that, that you would know today the riches that you have in Christ according to God's grace. So there's something happening here that this information was not known here or here before. It wasn't known in Jesus' earthly ministry of Jesus after the flesh, but it's all about Jesus. It's the gospel of Christ, the body of Christ, fellow heirs with Christ. That's what the mystery concerns, the mystery of Christ. This mystery was kept secret in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We've talked before in our series about kingdom mysteries. That's a question people often have in response to hearing this mystery given to Paul. They'll say, what about the mysteries Paul or Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And we had a whole lesson on that. The summary and conclusion was that those mysteries, he says, are mysteries of the kingdom. They're mysteries that had been spoken from the foundation of the world about those things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, Paul says, <clears throat> But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Paul says over and over again, this language, before the world, is this purpose that I'm now telling you about. Well, Jesus came to fulfill the purpose and promise that was spoken since the world began and after the world through all the prophets. Paul's speaking about something before the world, kept hidden. Ephesians 3, verse 9, he says, We're to make all men see, or he is to make all men see, the fellowship, what is the fellowship of the mystery, which was hid in God, who made all things by Jesus Christ from before the world began. And so, this was a hidden, secret information. Look at Romans 16. Let's turn to the left a couple pages. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Because you can preach Jesus Christ according to his earthly ministry, according to prophecy, according to Israel's expectations, according to the apostleship of these circumcision apostles. But Paul's saying, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. But it's now revealed. That's what he's implying there. So this mystery of Christ was hidden and kept secret. This ministry that Paul is doing, given to him by Jesus Christ, to communicate this revelation given to him by Jesus Christ about himself and what he's doing now, which is Christ's ministry. Right? What we are a part of is the ministry of Christ from heaven, because he's not here on earth, that's for sure. We're his body on earth. And so what he's doing now is different than here. His body was on earth, his individual body, and then it went to heaven. And then it said, his body will come back. But now, we're his body. And he's still in heaven. So in no way can that be this, because here, he comes back. <laughs> but he's in heaven, but where body is here. 
It's a different way of thinking about it. And Paul says it was kept secret. In this ministry he performs, he calls magnified in Romans 11, 13. I'm the apostle of Gentiles. I speak to you Gentiles as the apostle of Gentiles. I magnify mine office. What's he doing? Magnifying his office. He's doing that because his office now is superior than the previously given offices of every other apostle or prophet. Now that's very arrogant almost to say, unless it were true. He said, does it make it true? And you're right. But what we're reading here is that if Jesus returned and revealed to Paul information that was not known, that would make it true. Because there'd be no other prophet or apostle that knew what Jesus now revealed. Amen. To think we can only know Jesus according to this is missing the greater revelation of Jesus Christ. But you can't make movies about Paul's epistles. Right? And you can't see Jesus in Paul's epistles. That's also key. Because we want to see Jesus. Who doesn't? Like, we sing songs about it. But wanting to see Jesus, those songs, which I know that's true. I want to see him too. But that is focusing on Jesus after the flesh. If that's all your ministry is, is wanting to see Jesus, you're back here in Jesus after the flesh. Because you've missed knowing him now. And if you can't learn to know him now, the greater way of knowing him, then you'll never be satisfied that Jesus isn't here You'll never find peace. You'll never find contentment. You'll never know what God wants you to do because you're waiting for him to come back and tell you face to face. You see, he has revealed his ministry. There is something for the church to do. There is something he's called you to be today. That's different than before. Paul calls his office magnified. He calls his ministry as a master builder, a foundation. Jesus Christ is the foundation. He's the one preaching Jesus Christ, according to Revelation of the Mystery. He calls it a foundation. Now, how can you call your ministry foundational, right, unless you're preaching something different than what's been preached? You say, well, he's preaching it somewhere else. That's, that's the typical explanation, is that Peter was in Jerusalem, and Paul goes somewhere else, and thus he's laying a foundation. It's a different house somewhere else. But Jesus goes, or Paul goes to Jerusalem, and he communicates to Peter. And Peter acknowledges that Jesus spoke to you, and Peter says, they didn't add anything to me. Right? But I added something to them. Contrary-wise is what he says. In 1 first, in first Timothy 1, he calls his, 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 uh, his conversion and his apostleship given to him a pattern for those that should hereafter believe. Him being the chief of sinners, saved as he was by the Lord Jesus Christ, is a pattern for those that should hereafter believe. So that pattern did not exist before Paul. Right? He says actually the words, in me first, which people argue about, but he says in me first. But then he says, as a pattern. You can't argue pattern, a pattern's a pattern. We're not following Peter's pattern of salvation. That's not what 1 Timothy 1.16 says. And all this is according to Jesus' ministry. It's Jesus that saved him. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1. Jesus made him the pattern. Jesus showed forth long suffering. It was Christ that did it. So Jesus changed what was happening in the world, what he wanted people to do. So knowing Jesus now is knowing him according to this new revelation of the mystery that we can read about. In Paul's epistles. That's what it means to know Jesus now. Okay, now I want to go back to our previous six lessons and compare what we were learning about Jesus' earthly ministry to how we know Jesus now in contrast to the same subjects. Okay, so we can, we can see the difference here. Uh, before I do that, I need to put to rest the heresy. Okay, it's been preached for a couple decades now and has bred other people believing and following and teaching this heresy, which is the idea that Jesus did not know the mystery in his earthly ministry. And that is just incorrect. The mystery was not revealed in Jesus' earthly ministry. None of, during this time, the mystery that is now revealed was not known. I should draw up there. The mystery now revealed, right? It's now revealed about the gospel and about the body of Christ and about being joint heirs, the inheritance we have. It was not revealed prior. That does not mean Jesus didn't know it. Okay. The reason why people think that Jesus didn't know it is because Jesus was a man. And what did we talk about before? The focus of Jesus after the flesh typically emphasizes his humanity. Because that's, he walked around, and how did he walk around, how did he talk? And, but Jesus is a man even today. And he was a man before. And he had purposed with the Father. Right? It was his purpose. He created all things. When it says that the mystery was hidden in God, when it says that it was hidden wisdom before the world began, Jesus was part of that. 
before the world began was God, was the Word. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Godhead, always existed and always had the same purpose and always agreed with it and always knew it. Right? So Jesus did know the mystery that was hidden in God because he's the second person of the Godhead. Unless you want to trivialize that. Right? The Spirit, by the way, also knew. The Holy Spirit knew the mystery of Christ. Always knew it because the Holy Spirit never became man. There's no argument there. And he always knew the, 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 the purpose. Unless you want to say that one person of the Godhead knew something the other two didn't. Which means only a third of the Godhead is omniscient. Right? Nope, that's not true at all. God knew everything. They purposed it. Godhead, the one, three in one God. He purposed everything. And Jesus is fulfilling it. Fulfilling the, his prophetic part of it. And then fulfilling it by revealing the mystery here. He didn't go to heaven and have to learn from the Father. He didn't have to learn that he was the Son of God as water baptism. He didn't, even today, need to depend on the Father to tell him what to do. Jesus is Lord God, the only blessed potentate, the eternal King, the Lord of Lords. Amen. The only wise God. That's Pauline language. And he always has been. Okay? He knew the mystery. He's the one that revealed it to Paul. He wasn't saying, what was that again, Father? Oh, here you go, Paul. He knew it. All right? You see why I can't find a verse that shows it? He didn't reveal it. That's why. It was kept secret. All right. To say he didn't know what God knew is to say that he didn't have that deity attribute, which is a heresy. Yes. Okay? Mark 13, 32, by the way, and I know about that a couple weeks ago as well, doesn't say the son didn't know but God knew. It's that the son didn't know what the father knew the day and the hour. It has nothing to do with his omniscience. Okay. The Spirit knew the mystery of Christ, and the Holy Spirit at Pentecost did not utter the mystery from the mouths of the apostles. Was the Holy Ghost ignorant? No. That's not what God was doing. He was operating after the flesh here, preaching the kingdom, offering it to Israel. So let's put that to rest, okay? Jesus did know the mystery hidden in God. But after the flesh, Jesus ministered after the flesh. We've covered that before and what that meant. But now, look at 1 Corinthians 15. Paul's preaching Jesus not after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Well, how do we know him then? This is how we know him. Think of him this way. You can th think of him after the flesh. He was after the flesh, and, you know, he, he came to earth. He fulfilled a purpose. We know that. That's true about him. But now there's something else we know about him. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. <clears throat> He's talking about Resurrection. And this is important for Paul's ministry, because without the resurrection of Christ, you don't have a ministry by Paul. Amen. In fact, Paul makes the statement in 2 Timothy that Christ rose from the dead, not simply according to the kingdom program, which he was prophesied he would raise from the dead, but according to his gospel. Because without the resurrection, and really what it was accomplishing, according to the mystery, you don't have a body of Christ. You don't have a ministry in the body of Christ. Right? That resurrection is crucial to who we are and our ministry today. Amen. They were chosen before he rose from the dead. He needed to do it with full prophecy, but they didn't know what the ultimate outcome would be. But Paul says that it's sown, in verse 44, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. This is resurrection. So, Jesus put on human flesh, and he rose from the dead. It's sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body, and this is true for everyone who resurrects from the dead in glory. And it says in verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And that's what was written in Genesis. What's it say in the second half of the verse? The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now, who's the last Adam? It's Jesus. What's it mean to be a quickening spirit? He's not simply saying that he rose from the dead. He's saying he rose from the dead to make others rise from the dead. He's a quickening spirit. Adam was made a living soul, and so he begets children who are living souls. Jesus rose from the dead and begets children who are quickened in the spirit. So he's preaching Jesus and what he's doing now, that he's rose from the dead from heaven when you believe the gospel. You believe the gospel, you're a living soul, but then you get quickened in your spirit, yes? yes? That's what he's doing now. Jesus didn't teach that back here. They didn't teach that back They said, receive the Holy Ghost. This is quickened in your spirit. You are made new. You're made alive by Christ's resurrection. Look at verse 46. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Right? So... He had to come in the flesh first, of course, and you were born in the flesh, of course, first. It was for the first that came was natural. Verse, uh, but that which is natural and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth. 
earthy. That's Adam, yes? And Jesus after the flesh. <laughs> if you're preaching Jesus after the flesh, it'd be Jesus after the flesh. The first man knows Adam here is earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. But if he's on earth, he's not in heaven, is he? Well, except for John 3 when he says, I'm in heaven, and he's omnipresent, right? But the Lord from heaven is the Lord in heaven, preaching a ministry about him to you. So Paul's going back to Adam saying, <clears throat> Adam's of the earth, but the Lord that we're serving and preaching today is from heaven. Right? We know he came from heaven down to earth, but Paul says he's there now. And that means there's power in that. We know who he was in the flesh. We knew, know who he was prophetically. And now we know him and what he's doing from heaven. There was no communication of what he would do from heaven to the 12 apostles. It was simply that I'm going there and I'm coming back. Paul now is communicating what he's doing there through, through the church, through, to us and through us. <clears throat> So you see that Lord from heaven there. Jesus, after the flesh, lived a prophesied life. We covered a whole lesson on that. Everything he, he did was born, he spoke, he died according to prophecy. Right? Now, Jesus is spoken of as being unprophesied, unsearchable. We have known Jesus according to prophecy. That's how we know he's actually Christ. But now we're speaking things about him that were unsearchable. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, <clears throat> he appeared back to Paul, and that, that event was not prophesied anywhere. Right? For that reason, by the way, some people argue it never happened. Luke messed up. Paul messed up, which is a problem that you had two people testifying to it. But they say it wasn't according to prophecy. Really, we should follow Jesus according to prophecy and the law, and it's Hebrew, right? Because once you interject his appearing to Paul and Paul's ministry, things totally change. And people recognize this as they're more bold to speak about it. They say, well, Christianity is a Pauline invention. Well, Christ revealed it. Paul didn't invent it. But they get it right in that without Paul, you don't have the same thing. Very different. <clears throat> knowing Jesus is different according to prophecy than it is knowing him now. So it's a mystery. It's 1 Corinthians 15. You're in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. <clears throat> Paul says, Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures. <clears throat> Our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. That's here. At this time period right here. He was seen of above 500 people, he says in verse 6 and 7. He was seen of all the apostles. And then verse 8. Last of all, he was seen of me, also as of one born out of due time. Why did he add that statement at the end there? He could have just said he was seen of me too, last one. I was the last one to see him. Right here. And he sees him again and again and again, by the way. Okay. But then he says, as one born out of due time. What's that business? I mean, Jesus came according to due time. He died according to due time. He ascended according to due time. And according to Jesus' own words, he'll return in due time. And yet, here he comes appearing to Paul. That's not a time due anywhere in prophecy. And Paul says, I was born, he appeared to me, out of due time. Right? Can't find that in prophecy anywhere. And so, Jesus led a prophesied life. And then he appeared, not according to prophecy. Whoops. What do you do with that? Nowhere is it said, according to the prophets, Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. Nowhere. Nowhere does it say, according to prophecy, and suddenly Jesus appeared to the chief of sinners and decided to make him an apostle. Nowhere is that found. Okay. Prophesied life? Now we're talking about the unspoken of Jesus. What's he doing that he kept secret? He's, he's gone off the rails. He's gone off prophetic rails, right? Yes, but it's still according to his purpose. It's a purpose that was hidden. That's what Paul makes clear. It's like, it was a purpose of God. It just wasn't known. Okay. And so you have unprophesied out of due time, Jesus. Jesus' earthly ministry, now it's from heaven. Colossians 3.1, he says, Paul teaches, set your affections on things above, where Christ sitteth in the right hand of God. Set your affections up there. What did the angels say to, of the twelve who are setting their affections on the cloud that Jesus descended unto? He said, what are you doing here? Go, go back over there and do what Jesus told you to do. Right? Paul tells you to set your affections on things above, where Christ sits up there. And part of that is because of Philippians 3.20, Paul says our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation, that's not simply what we talk about. That's like our, our life is in heaven. Colossians 3 says the same thing. He, our life is hid with Christ. And where is that? In heaven. But we're in his body. 
His life is manifest through us, his life. God is not manifest in you. But the life of Jesus is manifest in you. That's a different thing. Just because you have Jesus' life doesn't mean you're God. He is the life. Meanwhile, earthly ministry, now it's from heaven. Ephesians 2, 6, and 7, Paul says that we are seated with him in heavenly places. All spiritual blessings are in Christ in heavenly places. So suddenly Paul starts talking about a position that we have in this new creature called the body that's in heaven. Jesus didn't talk about this. He promised these guys thrones on the earth when he comes back. He promised Israel and the fathers, confirming those promises, of a kingdom and land on the earth when he comes back. But to Paul, suddenly Jesus is talking about heavenly positions and places and that you're a part of it if you get saved by the gospel. Well, that's a new offering, isn't it? Like, that wasn't offered before, now it's offered. Yeah, it's a new offering or a new gospel or a new calling. It's a new thing. And so it's not simply that we see that Paul says mystery, mystery. As objectors point out, Jesus spoke mysteries and so did the Old Testament prophets. But it's what that mystery is. It was kept secret. It's about a new calling. It's about a new inheritance, a new identity, a new gospel. Not excluding Jesus, by the way. Jesus is the heart of it. It's a mystery about him. And so you have... A heavenly ministry now, which is why on the top of your outline I put a study of the heavenly ministry of Christ because he didn't reveal the mystery in his earthly ministry. Jesus was a minister of the circumcision. We covered that in a whole lesson six weeks ago. And yet now he's a minister to all. And Christ is wanting to minister to all and he does that through you, through the apostle Paul, first of all. In Acts 9.15, his his statement about Paul is that he was a chosen vessel in Acts 9, the moment he was saved, a chosen vessel to preach Jesus and suffer things for Jesus among the Gentiles, the children of Israel, and all kings, and all sort of thing. Everyone Paul was to go to. So it's not simply to the circumcision. In Romans 15, the verse that we had that lesson about, where it says Jesus was a minister of the circumcision, in the same chapter, Paul contrasts that to his own ministry. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So it's not that I should be the minister of the Gentiles, but that I should be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Jesus sent him. That's, that's crucial. That's why the lesson is Jesus reveals the mystery. He did it. Don't blame Paul. Don't blame us. Jesus did this. And it's in the scripture because the Holy Ghost inspired it. We're just studying scripture and reading what it says. But people tend to stop after the death and resurrection. Because you go too far, you become Pentecostal, you know. Then who knows what's after that. <laughs> Keep going. Jesus came back and revealed what the church is today. And without knowing that, you see the consequences of not knowing that? Now, I'm not here saying that churches don't know Paul's epistles because a lot of this may sound familiar. Like, oh yeah, we always knew we were going to heaven. Right? If we're saved by the gospel. Uh, you might have, but that came from Paul. Right. Well, I always thought I was saved by Christ's finished work. Well, good for you, but that came from Paul. It wasn't taught before. See? So knowing where it fits means that you know in the Bible where your instructions are at and where to find what God is doing today or how to know Jesus now or how to discern what's more excellent than others. So you don't fall into the morass of thinking that if they just mention Jesus, that's great. Uh, actually, the greatest revelation of Jesus Christ was given to you in the body of Christ today through the Apostle Paul. Amen. And if you're preaching Jesus a different way, you're preaching him in an inferior way than what he wants to be known today. Well, Jesus was a baby in a manger. Yes, he was. Praise God for that because he would eventually grow up and he would die. He'd raise from the dead. He'd go to heaven. And then he'd reveal this great revelation about who you are in Christ. That's the finish point. It's not, oh, but he was a cute baby and he was a man like us. And keep going. If you stop that and that's your ministry, well, you got to know that. You know, I'm not quite sure how much an unbeliever needs to be settled in this. Like, they need to know it, right? An unbeliever needs the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that begins with his death and resurrection. you got to know who he is, so I'm not saying you ignore it. But you're talking about, we're going to win them by all the great miracles Jesus did. Yeah, he was the son of God, manifest in the flesh, you got to know that, who died for your sins, who rose from the dead. That's the beginning of the Christian life. And then guess what? You open your Bible and you read it. What else did he do? Oh, he fulfilled a bunch of prophecies? That's amazing. Right? What else did he do? Oh, he preached a kingdom come. He gave signs of his return. 
You don't need to know those signs to be saved. No. Right? You don't need to know every prophecy he fulfilled to be saved. You don't need to know, okay, that uh, when he came he, in, in Romans 15, he was a minister of the circumcision to be saved. But that's the reality of it. Right? So usually what happens when people depict his earthly ministry is they'll take out all of those details and try to import something that sounds Pauline onto his earthly ministry, which causes more confusion. Jesus came overturning things, bringing new revelations, and he's a revolutionary. And he, he went to everybody, Jews and Gentiles, he's breaking down barriers and walls. Well, that's what he did here. Don't put that back here. He wasn't an earthly revolutionary. He did that from heaven through the body of Christ, by his grace. When you start making an earthly revolution, and you're tying it to an earthly kingdom, right? And so you have issues here. This is called dividing the Bible into its respective revelations, or rightly dividing. If you don't do it right, you're wrongly dividing. That's the, the opposite of that. Jesus is now ministering to all. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, this is the dispute between Peter and Paul. There were circumcision going to the Gentiles in Paul's ministry, saying you need to keep the law and be circumcised. And Paul had no small problem with that. It was a big problem. And in Galatians 2, in Acts 15, he goes to Peter to make sure he didn't start this confusion. Peter, by the way, says he didn't. So don't blame Peter. Peter says, we didn't send him. Right? Well, good. That way you can agree to leave my guys alone. <laughs> and they did. Okay? But that also shows you that Peter wasn't ministering with Paul what Paul was sent to do. Or else Paul would never have even gone to him. Paul didn't go to Peter and the conversation was, hey, I thought we were on the same page. He went to Peter saying, here's my page. Christ appeared to me after you. Right? That's how they knew in Galatians 2. It says in verse 6, he went to those who seemed to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrarywise, which means what? He added something to them. When they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, which they didn't even know about, I'm putting my amplifications in here, but they, 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 that's what he's adding to them. What, what did they not know that Paul's speaking of? Uh, Christ sent me to preach to Gentiles. Uh, Israel's not ready yet. Don't matter. There's a gospel of the uncircumcision. Huh. Prove it. Well, he appeared to me on the road to Damascus and told me these things. Peter says, I didn't appear to me, Peter says. Well, Paul says, he appeared to me. And it's the same Jesus that the Scriptures testified of. Right? Anyway, I'm, I'm speculating now. Galatians 2, verse 7, he says, The gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Just as Peter was sent to Israel, as Jesus was sent to Israel with that gospel, Paul says, Christ, just as true as that, sent me with the gospel of the uncircumcision. For he that wrought effectually in Peter, that's Jesus, to the apostle of the circumcision, the same Jesus, was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And they gave him the right hands of fellowship. What's this all mean? That now we know Jesus not, not, not uh, resigned and restricted to Israel. You say, well, I don't know a church that does restrict him to Israel. Well, that's because of the revelation given to Paul. Right? And if you don't recognize that, you'll take verses about God's will for you from places where he is restricted to Israel, and you'll make those restrictions dangerous. You say, well, how, how is that possible? You know, in, in America, among other places in the world, we're not the only place that did it, in America, among other places in the world, in the 1800s, they justified the divisions of skin colors among people based upon the Israel-Gentile distinction in the Bible. Like, if they had only known the revelation of the mystery, as it was taught the revelation of the mystery, that there is no Jew or Gentile today, Amen. then if you're quoting Deuteronomy to someone because of their skin color, you're entirely wrong, not just because it's racist, but because it's doctrinally incorrect. Which is to say that God today does not separate races, right? According to the revelation of the mystery. That's biblically taught, very clear. So you don't have to argue with someone. The Bible teaches slavery, not according to the revelation of the mystery. Amen. So, I mean, do you know what the most excellent revelation is in the Bible? Genesis. No, it's the revelation of the mystery. Even to Paul, you see. It changes things when you understand what Jesus is doing now. That's not to say that God was racist before. It simply had a nation that he had chosen. It had nothing with skin color. Meanwhile, in Colossians 3, Paul says, There's no Jew nor Greek, barbarian or Scythian, uncircumcision or circumcision, bond or free. You're all in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, verse 11. According to the Revelation of the Mystery, there's no distinction. 
Jesus came to confirm the promises made to the fathers in his earthly ministry. And yet now, Paul is talking about those who were at one time in the past strangers of the promises, not being strangers anymore. So the promises you were never given, but now you have access to God through Jesus Christ. You're partakers of the promise by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not because you become Israel. Right? Colossians 1.25, Paul says he was made a minister of the dispensation of God given to him, which was not known. Colossians 1.25, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God given to me for you to fulfill the word of, the, fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages. Ages is time. Ages and ages ago. And from generations. Generations are people. You have generations of people. So from all time and from all people, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Gentiles. He was never promised to Gentiles. Well, now according to the mystery, we all partake of Christ if we believe the gospel. Okay, that's Colossians 1, 20, 25 through 27. We pre preached, uh, according to his earthly ministry, one of the purposes Jesus came on earth was to manifest God in the flesh. He was God manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 says that, as well as John 1 and Colossians 2. And uh, that's what he was doing there. His purpose was to manifest God in the flesh. We can't see Jesus in the flesh today because he's not here. It would be an error, an error to say that, well, you can see Jesus by looking at me. Right? I'm God manifest in the flesh. No. No, I'm not. And no are you. I can't look at you and say, Jesus, or God. I can't do that. The fact that you are a member of the body is something I must take by faith. I cannot see it. And that's what the word manifest is. He can only be manifest here and here. Otherwise, you don't see Jesus. Right? Manifest means to see. He appeared to Paul. Paul saw him. But you don't. Now he's manifesting not himself in the flesh, but rather himself from heaven, for you to walk by faith in, okay, and manifesting his life given to all. In 2 Timothy 1, in the same passage, he says he was appointed a preacher and apostle. He says that he brought life and immortality to life. He made known the manifold wisdom of God. So what's made clear now that you can see is God's will and purpose from before the world began. His ultimate wisdom and will. You can understand that now. Whereas before, there's still lots of questions. Will you at this time, we don't know what's going on. Who are you? Why are you dying? Now, you know God's wisdom from before the world began. That's made clear. Jesus in the flesh, you have to take that by faith. Yeah. Right? That's not being revealed today. <clears throat> and so now, what is being manifest in the flesh? Well, you're in Christ. <clears throat> in Christ is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yeah. Bodily was back here. He has a body now too, but he's talking about he was God in the flesh, right? And you, Paul teaches, are complete in him. That's mystery truth. God being all the fullness of the Godhead, or Jesus being all the fullness of the Godhead bodily was not a mystery. That was here. That was according to prophecy. You being complete in him, that was mystery. Right? I'm complete in the fullness of the Godhead bodily? Yep. That doesn't make you part of the Trinity, by the way. Right? You being complete means he accomplished everything for you. There's nothing else you need. Which is why in Colossians 1, he says, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, because if you don't continue in the faith and the doctrine of what Christ is teaching today, then guess what? You will feel incomplete and like you're missing something. Namely, Jesus' presence or the Holy Ghost filling or something. But if you continue in the faith, you'll know, which is true, that you're complete in Christ. What that verse is talking about. <clears throat> it is possible for someone to be saved and not know some of these truths. And that's a problem because they'll act accordingly. Right? And so you have Jesus manifest in the flesh. Now you're complete in him. By the way, Paul also teaches about the flesh that we have no confidence in it. So it's odd that someone would say, I'm God manifest in the flesh, in the body of Christ, which is, again, it's a total error, misunderstanding, if not heresy at worst. And then at the same time, read Philippians 3, which says we have no confidence in the flesh. Well, either we have no confidence in the flesh, or we should say, I'm God manifest in the flesh. Which is it? Right? But the truth is we have no confidence in the flesh. In Philippians 2, verse 5, or Philippians 3, verse 3. Philippians 2, verse 5 speaks about this mind being in you. Right? It's the mind of Christ that we're to have. 
New Testament. Jesus came in his earthly ministry to die as a testator of the New Testament. He spoke about that before he died and his blood being a testament. Hebrews explains that. He came as a sacrifice to institute that New Testament. But now, Jesus is not ministering a New Testament, though we're able to because we know why he died, according to prophecy. We have known him after the flesh, yet now henceforth know him no more. He's now ministering the new creature, of which he is the head. Okay. The new creature was something not known before. In fact, in the verse that we use as our theme, that we know, henceforth know we him no more after the flesh, Second Corinthians 5.16, the very next verse says, Now if a man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things become new. These things are old, these are things that are new. All right, that's what that is. Don't make that about you personally and that now that I'm saved, everything that I was is gone, now everything that I am is different. Well, that may be true, incidentally, in the body of Christ, but Paul's talking about any man and talking about the old things that have gone on before. Because right after that verse, he starts explaining the ministry that was given to the body of Christ, the ministry of reconciliation, how that we're ambassadors for Christ. This is the body of Christ. That's what we are. Right? And so that's, that's the new thing God is doing. It's a new creature. And Paul brings this up over and over again. Ephesians 2 those that were strangers of the promises and uh, of the commonwealth of Israel, he, he doesn't say, but now you are the commonwealth of Israel. He doesn't say that as a conclusion. He says, uh, but now you're made nigh. You're brought close to God. That's the idea there. Not close to Israel, but close to God uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he made of two, Jew and Gentile, one new thing. Amen. He doesn't say he took of the two and made one, grafted into the other thing. And so now there's just one vine. No, he made of the two one new thing. Oh, it's a new thing. It's not either one of the old things. Yeah. Jews and Gentiles both are old things. I mean, they both go back to the same time. You couldn't have a Gentile without a Jew because that was the distinction. God called Israel out, and thus there's Gentiles. Without Je Jews, they're just people, right? That's what's going on today. There is no Israel today as spiritual standing with God, so there's just people who believe or don't believe, who are in the body or are not in the body, who are the new creature or are not the new creature. That's the difference. Galatians 6, verse 15, Paul says, Uncircumcision doesn't avail anything, availeth not, and circumcision availeth not, but a new creature. That's what avails. It doesn't matter, circumcision or uncircumcision. Well, Jesus was a minister of the circumcision, and that mattered back here. So, this must be a different thing going on. Knowing Jesus now isn't about the flesh. Isn't about your law keeping. You're not under the law. Ephesians 4, Paul talks about putting on the new man, which is made in righteousness after Jesus Christ. And he says, you have not so learned Christ, or he's rather exhorting them to learn Christ properly, is what he's doing, about renewing your mind and putting on the new man. That's how you should know Christ. That's how you learn Christ. That's how you're taught of Christ today. Ephesians 4 has the language of verse 20, you, you have not so learned Christ. Well, how are you taught of Christ? If you think by going back here to hear Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, that's not what Jesus is teaching today. Jesus revealed what he wants you to know today. So to, be, to be taught of him is to learn what Jesus has now revealed. Then you're taught of him. Because you don't find the new man being put on back here. You find it here. Okay. So Jesus is teaching. He's ministering today through his word revealed according to the revelation of the mystery. It's a different way to know him and thus know yourself, by the way. To know Jesus is also to speak about your relation to him, yes? Know Jesus after the flesh means that your relation to him is after the flesh. Know Jesus from heaven, according to the mystery, is, is to say your relation to him is according to this mystery, a new creature. Your identity changes. Your inheritance changes. He was a sacrifice for many. He said that before he died. He said, this is my blood shed for many. All right, over and over again, Paul says he was a ransom for all. Yeah. Be testified in due time. So he was saved out of due time, but to be testified in due time speaks to the fact that God had always purposed that he would make this known. Right? So that he reveals something to Paul, and this, this is going on today for 2,000 years, that prophecy did not get fulfilled 2,000 years ago, which is the great dilemma for Christianity, it really is, speaks to the existence of a due time revelation from Jesus that's in the scripture that apparently people neglect, that explains what God's been doing for 2,000 years. That explains why he's got unfinished business, why this stopped happening, and why we operate a different way today than what even Jesus ministered in his earthly ministry. Why is it that Christians get blamed for not acting like Jesus in his earthly ministry? Because they can't do it. They can't do it because of the law, but they can't do it because he was God in the flesh. There's lots of reasons they can't do it. 
But Jesus is teaching something through here, and this is something that can manifest God's glory if we would simply believe in it and walk in it. Amen. God is dispensing grace to this world. Grace to sinners, all sinners, which is why he's not judging sinners with lightning bolts. Atheist says, why does he send a lightning bolt down? He's not judging you today. He will. I mean, you want lightning bolts, it'll be a day, but I, I don't recommend it. Right? He's offering to save you by his grace today. That's why he's not sending lightning bolts. It's also a reason why he doesn't supernaturally bless Christians either, because he's not judging their goodness either. Amen. Well, I'm a good person. God blessed me for that. No, he didn't. He, just like he didn't judge that guy for what he did wrong. He's not judging. He's offering grace to be saved to everybody. Amen. Take it or leave it. Christians will always want more. So do everybody wants more. So he was a sacrifice for many, but now he's a, he's a ransom for all. His death wasn't just to mediate and testify a better testament that would come back on a prophesied day of atonement. His death is now your death. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. His death is your death. His resurrection is your resurrection. Now his cross work is not a shame as it was here. It's glorious. God forbid that we glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a way of preaching the cross that they did not even understand here, let alone preach. Right? We now know something about Jesus' death and resurrection that was not known. We know something, that, uh, an entity that he's building in the body of Christ that was not known. This new creature, this spiritual new creature that has no claim of a land, that has no claim of earthly riches, that has no claim of, of flesh heritage, is something that was not known before. Okay? And it is more glorious. <clears throat> What about signs? One of the major lessons we had recently, I think it was last week, uh, signs of his return. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 to the Thessalonians, You have no need I write unto you concerning the signs. Of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Why? Because they already know there's things according to prophecy, and guess what? They're not in prophecy, so we're not in the time for the signs. Jesus says signs will happen. Look for the signs. The apostles are looking up, and they're still waiting for his return. And now Paul says, you have no need of this. Right? Jesus is doing something in and through you that doesn't require a special sign. You just have to know that and believe that and operate accordingly, and the Spirit works through you. Right? Paul says, That's not the mission of the ministry today. Okay? Paul says, instead of watching for his return, which is a subject of all the a lot of the parables, is watching for his return to earth, Instead, we're to watch the doctrine. And the only time Paul mentions watch is in 2 Timothy 4. We studied this recently in 2 Timothy, where Paul tells him to watch. And that has to do with watching for error and heresy and teaching truth. Because today, God is revealing a truth, his manifold wisdom. He revealed the finished up the scripture, so that the man of God may be perfect in understanding and knowledge. He's not saying watch the sky. He's not saying wait till I get back, and then the party will really start. Which is what happened with these guys. He says, there'll be some trouble, endure the trouble, and it'll be greater later. That's what Jesus told the apostles. Paraphrase, right? But what do you tell to Paul, to the body of Christ? He says, here's a ministry, and minister this ministry till I come. Because when I come, you can't do that anymore. What? You see how that's different? One is like, you better bunker up, because the trouble's coming, and when I come back, I'll set things right. That's the day they're waiting for. That's the day we're all waiting for. That's the day they're waiting for. We now know Jesus, according to the mystery, and he says, I got a mission for you to do in this present evil world, and you can only do it before I come. So do it till I come. Right? You can't see souls saved by the gospel grace of God when Christ returns to the earth. You can't see souls saved in heaven. Mark Cahill wrote a famous book about that, right? You can't, things you can't do in heaven. Can't evangelize, can't do that. Well, this is the sole function of the body of Christ in this dispensation. He didn't tell the Roman apostles to do that. He said, go to Jerusalem, get them on board with the kingdom so I can bring my kingdom back so we can bless the world. Well, that didn't happen. But he sends the church out saying, go preach the gospel of my grace to everybody. All right? Get them saved. Get them edified in the knowledge of the truth. Be thankful in everything. Walk by faith. Do that till I come. Because when he comes, guess what? We're not walking by faith anymore. We're not evangelizing anymore. We don't have to grow up into the head. We'll be with the head. Amen. Right? But things will change when we get to heaven and when he return to, we return to him. But our ministry now, you see how our ministry now is different? It's something we can only do now. So in that sense, it's almost like, well, we, the whole church ministry stops once he comes back. Peter's ministry would begin when he came back. Do you get it? Until then, he's just making sure he can carry it through to the end. So, Jesus now, Jesus after the flesh are different. 
What about his return to judge? His signs of his return meant when he come back, he would judge the nations of this world and up, overturn things so that his kingdom would rise up and the kingdoms of the world would fall down. So he'd return to judge the world, bring righteous judgment. Right? Yet now, here's Jesus returning, not to the earth, but to Paul and revealing himself to him. And returns to do what? Is it to judge the world? It's to show Paul grace. It's to reveal a mystery. It's to dispense grace and to deliver these people from the wrath to come. That seems like a pretty good, me a big message, right? To deliver people from the wrath to come by the grace of God. Peter says, repent or you'll be destroyed. And he's not preaching God's grace here. Because he better follow Moses and follow Jesus and, and, and repent of, his, of crucifying him. Paul says, we're delivered from the wrath to come. We're not enduring tribulation, right? <clears throat> the great tribulation, which was not since the world began. The great tribulation, which includes uh, later God's wrath on the earth, is something that does not apply to those who have peace with God, Romans 5, verse 1. Right, so Paul teaches things differently. Remember Matthew 24 and those signs we read through last week, how it says, woe to them that are with child, with pregnant, right? What's Paul say? <clears throat> By revelation of Christ, Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, I will that young women marry. Have children. Whoa. Jesus said, whoa. Paul says Jesus revealed something else. Jesus said, here, sell everything you had. Paul said, here, work. you don't work, you don't eat. Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation in the temple, Paul says, what temple? You are the temple. There's a different way of knowing Jesus now than here, apparently. And it's not Paul versus Jesus. It's the same Jesus who revealed this information. Paul's just recording it. But you see how this can affect your understanding of Jesus and what he's doing. <clears throat> Jesus told his apostles to wait until I come in glory. There'll be suffering first, and then the glory that should follow. Yes, that's what Peter talked about, the prophets talk about. Paul says, we now know him in glory, the Lord of glory. We, have the, we stand in, by grace, and uh, by faith in his grace that, that we stand in the hope and the glory of God. We have the glory of God in Christ Jesus, the glorious gospel. <clears throat> Jesus told his apostles, his 12 apostles on earth, according to the flesh, to wait for the time, endure to the end of the time, and the time will come, right? What does he tell Paul? Redeem the time. Amen. Because if you don't, you'll lose it. Well, you kind of want the time to fly by if you're waiting for the time of his return. Yeah. Yes? In fact, Jesus even says, I'll shorten the day so it's not so long. But then to Paul, he says, redeem the time. As if you have a problem and a loss if the time flies by you. And that's true because you have a job to do now, according to a new ministry of Jesus Christ, that if it doesn't get done, there's a problem. Amen. Okay, so you see the differences here. What's the conclusion? Knowing Jesus now is different than knowing Jesus after the flesh. And the greatest message of Christ was not Jesus after the flesh, but it's Jesus as he was revealed in the mystery from heaven. Okay. Jesus after the flesh is preached to the detriment of knowing Jesus now. So I'll just teach them both. Well, you should know all of Scripture. So you, you have known and you should. We just taught six weeks on this earthly ministry. You should know it, right? There's a lot of stuff in there. There's more things we could teach. But if that's all you're teaching, if that's the primary emphasis of your preaching of Jesus, then it's to the detriment of knowing Jesus now, which means it hinders people's growth, if not their understanding of the gospel. It means they definitely won't rejoice in the, the inheritance that they have in Christ by his grace. And so our commission is, is Paul's commission, is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which was hid in Christ before the world began. In 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul says, we know him no more after the flesh, he goes on to describe the mission that we have. He says, all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That was not Peter's ministry. To reconcile Jews and Gentiles. To reconcile sinners to God. That's not what he came to preach. Okay. That would happen here. The whole world will be blessed through Jesus here. But here? While the world's presently evil, while Israel's fallen? That's a mystery. Paul says... To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. This is happening right here at the cross. And Paul says, Jesus revealed to me what he was doing back here. They were killing him. They didn't know what he was doing, which means Jesus knew what he was doing. When he said, Father, forgive them. Yeah. Guess what that means? He knew what he was doing had a greater purpose. Yeah. 
Jesus knew the mystery, folks. Right? He didn't reveal it. But he was in, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So what Jesus was doing there, we now preach according to the revelation of the mystery. Verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God had beseeched you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. That message is not known in Jesus' earthly ministry, or preaching Jesus after the flesh. Okay? And that will conclude our series on his earthly ministry, ending with his heavenly ministry, what he's doing now. Any questions or comments about 